Welcome to Unit 10. With this unit, we cross a divide, admittedly an artificial divide created by historians and the divide between the College Board's two units on Western art. Most historians date what they call early modern Europe from the Renaissance and modern Europe from the French Revolution, which we'll encounter very soon. But the 17th century, which we've just dashed through, is really a transitional century that laid the groundwork for what we now call the modern world. Let's view this transition through the lens of art. You've seen this painting by Rubens before. The work proclaimed an art that war is stupid and destructive. And of course, the great wars of the first half of the 17th century were fought over religion, although the pursuit of political power was often in practice the more important motive. Nevertheless, the bloody wars of religion did encourage many 18th century thinkers, such as Voltaire and Locke, to argue for religious toleration and, especially in Voltaire's case, to deride the church for promoting conflict and what he saw as superstition. Stay tuned. These two paintings reveal another crucial 17th century transition. You recognize Raphael's School of Athens, I trust, and you should be able to guess the painter who executed the painting on the bottom right. Yup, it's a Vermeer. Note the interior scene and the light cast by a window that fails to give a glimpse of the outside. What you probably won't know is that Vermeer's astronomer is reading a book that discusses modern astronomical discoveries by Copernicus, Galileo, and other leaders of the scientific revolution. We also see modern, at least for the time, celestial globe. Raphael included plenty of scientists in his school of Athens, but they're all from the ancient world. Vermeer's scientist is a modern man. In fact, scholars think that the model was his friend Van Leeuwenhoek, who invented a superior microscope and more or less founded the science of microbiology. So, what's the word for science and reason that's based on observation of and experiments involving the real world? You may have answered scientific method, and that's a right answer. But the word I'm looking for is empiricism. That means backing theories with data that can be quantifi quantified and replicated in future studies. Rachel Royce's father was an empiricist. That is, he cataloged the natural world in his laboratories, and his daughter captured that reality on canvas. There may be religious symbols in the grapes and wheat, but this painting is mostly about the natural world that we can observe with our eyes and maybe our microscope. So what point do you think I might be making by showing you these two slides? The 17th century saw much broader contact between Europe and the rest of the world. The Enconchado style of the, street of the screen attests to Mexico's contact with Japan via the Philippines, while the Ming jar in the Dutch landscape was a treasured import from China. Growing knowledge of and fascination with the rest of the world will become a more central theme as we move into the modern era. Okay, last blast from the recent past. What important 17th century developments am I getting at here? The 1600s witnessed the rise of powerful nation states led by absolute rulers and many of them sought out empires in the Americas, the Middle East, North Africa, and Asia. The rise of absolute monarchies is really best represented by this guy, who didn't show up at all in our last unit. That's partly because the College Board didn't stick any French Baroque paintings on its list, not even this one, an old College Board favorite, but also because I decided to kick off this unit with the one French Baroque work on our required works list, which is the Palace of Versailles. First, let's catch up with France and introduce Louis XIV. In France, the religious wars took the form of a civil war between the Catholics and Calvinist Huguenots, who actually controlled a good chunk of France. Here you see a Protestant painter's depiction of one of the bloodiest episodes from these wars. But the theological and artistic battles that animated Italian, Flemish, Spanish, and even Dutch Baroque art mostly passed France by. In France, politics generally trumped religion. Marie de Medici's grandson, Louis XIV, ruled France for 72 years. He came to the throne when he was only seven years old, so he reigned for most of our Baroque century. 
Civil war broke out again when Louis XIV was a young boy, this time because the French nobility was revolting against, against French royal power. And young Louis was forced to flee for his life. Louis XIV learned some important lessons from his turbulent youth, and when he came of age, he set about establishing strong, centralized rule that revolved around Louis XIV, the Sun King, the way the planets re revolved around the sun. Yes, in a way, Copernicus had triumphed even in politics. In 1665, the Sun King summoned the famous Roman architect Bernini, remember St. Teresa, to France to design a new east facade for his palace, the Louvre. Here are some of Bernini's sketches of his proposed design, but it turned out to be just a little too Italian for French taste. So here's the design that won out in the end. You may notice the same architects designed Versailles. Louis XIV rejected the curves, the high drama of Bernini's design, and instead he went for classical, imposing, and horizontal. This is a building that exudes stability and it exudes power. But Louis XIV still had a power problem. French nobles continued to resent the reestablished central royal power. Louis needed to keep his nobles under control, and he needed to keep them entertained so that they wouldn't have the time, resources, or desire to rebel. So this was his solution, a palace complex 11 miles from the hotbed of noble power, which was Paris. Here's the first of our required images for this work. And here we see the gardens. For some reason, the landscape designer doesn't appear in the College Board identifiers, but I'm sticking him in because I'm an avid gardener and think that landscape architects are true artists. At any rate, the image on the upper right is our required image. What do you notice about the design of these gardens as your eye moves from the formal gardens surrounding the palace back into the grounds? That is the picture on the bottom right. Nature near the palace is fully disciplined by royal power. As the gardens recede, however, they become more natural, less tame. Again, as the photo of the so-called groves on the bottom right demonstrates. But nature wasn't allowed all that much free reign at Versailles. Laying out the gardens, even the informal gardens, required enormous works. The original woods, grasslands, and marshes were covered with thousands of wheelbarrow loads of dirt. Trees were carted in from all over the provinces of France, and thousands of men, sometimes whole regiments, took part in this vast enterprise. To get to Versailles, one entered through three roads that converged to the chateau, with the axes finally joining, not accidentally, in Louis' bedroom. As the AP Classroom questions remind us, the layout on an east-west axis is quite deliberate. It echoes the path of the sun, the path to the sun king, lying in bed. So here are two, oops, here are two additional required images of the imposing entrance. We see a few more Baroque touches, but the general impression is classical, stately, and horizontally massive. Again, this is all about the weight and might of royal power. And here is Versailles' most famous room, the Hall of Mirrors, and on the right, our final required image. Again, this reception room was designed to dazzle in every sense of the word, and of course, the mirrors just magnify the size of the room and the brilliance of the candlelit gold. The mirrors were also designed to reflect the magnificent gardens outside the windows. This room looks a little more Baroque with its curved ceiling and its over-the-top decoration. I'm going to move on now to my second lecture and the art of an aristocratic France whose days were numbered.